The Bible Treasury. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 19, Article 52, 1 of 24, 1892 and 1893. Gospel Words, 3rd Series. 12 Parts. 4 of 12. 4. The Two Trees. Genesis 2 verse 9. Scarce any fact of paradise seems less understood than that recorded in the latter half of Genesis 2 verse 9, none supposed to be more distinctly an early myth. Yet were these two trees, singled out from the rest, a positive fact suited to that day of primeval innocence, and to no other, but embodying divine principles of the deepest and most enduring value for all time, and this without applying force to either, or indulging in imagination of any kind, but in subjection to the indications of the inspired record itself. And the truth conveyed intimately concerns every soul of man. The first thing to note is that the tree of life in the midst of the garden was absolutely distinct from that of knowledge of good and evil. To eat of the latter was forbidden on pain of certain death, verse 17. Only when the man did eat of the prohibited tree, the Lord God took care that he should not take also of the tree of life, Genesis 3 verse 22, it would have been the perpetuated life of sinful man, a calamity, and violation of all orders, not a blessing. Apart from that transgression, the tree of life was open to him, and expressly outside the tree of knowledge. Clearly then the first tree points out the channel of life for man unfallen, the provision of God for Adam in paradise freely given and quite independently of the second tree, so true is this that man forfeited his title to partake of the one tree when he ate of the other. Man was responsible not to eat of the tree of knowledge, if he abstained, he was free to eat of the tree of life. When guilty and fallen, he was debarred, and driven out, with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, Genesis 3 verse 24. Now the constant effort of man, especially of religious man, is as it were to identify the two trees, that is, to suspend life on the fulfillment of responsibility, a notion which flies in the face of the facts, when man was innocent, and still more manifestly false, when man was a sinner, and expressly excluded from the tree of life. The original relationship was lost through transgression. The only natural religion that ever had or could have reality had ceased to be. All henceforth turned on what God is to man in saving mercy. Man in the most favorable circumstances had wholly failed toward God. Sin morally compelled God to be a judge. Love, divine grace, made him a savior. Even so, it was to lie only in and through his son, his deigning to become man, and his going down into death and judgment for the guilty. The Father hath sent the Son as Savior of the world, 1 John 4 verse 14, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19 verse 10. But consider the intermediate dealings of God before the advent. The epistle to the Galatians lays great stress on the promises as given, a covenant previously confirmed by God, 430 years before the law. They, too, were thereby so arranged that the one could not annul, still less be confounded with, the other. Now the promises answered to the tree of life, as the law to the tree of knowing good and evil. The promises were the unconditional and pledged grace of God, designedly long before, and absolutely distinct from, the law, which expressed his righteous demand from man on the ground of his responsibility. If Israel, if any, pretended to stand on that ground before God, the ten words were his terms. Such terms can only be a ministry of death and condemnation to sinful creatures, as Israel were, as all mankind are. The fatal mistake then as always is to seek life by meeting man's responsibility. Israel took that ground and failed utterly, as all sinners must who go the same path. Scripture records the failure in the Old Testament and explains it in the New Testament, that men now may profit by that solemn lesson of old and betake themselves only to God's grace in Christ. For Christ alone has solved the problem, and this by accepting the full responsibility of man and bearing the consequences of sin and our sins in death, yeah, death of the cross, so that, after glorifying God perfectly, he is risen from the dead, a life-giving spirit to all believers. 
thus there is no condemnation to those that are in him, in whom the two trees are thus brought into blessed harmony for our salvation unto God's glory. As responsible men, we are ungodly and powerless, as the Apostle asserts beyond dispute. So the Lord treats even the Jews as lost, which closes the question of that responsibility. What more presumptuous in our sinful state of fallen nature than to seek life by pretending to fulfill our duty as men? Even to innocent man, as Genesis 2 teaches, life and responsibility were set expressly and altogether apart. But as Christ gives life freely to believers in his name, so is he propitiation by his death for their sins. For both were absolutely needed, if we were to be made meet for sharing the portion of the saints in light, and both are now given of God through faith to every believer, who has eternal life in the Son and through his blood redemption, the forgiveness of our offenses. Not that a new responsibility is lacking, but it is the responsibility of a child of God. So himself said, Because I live, ye shall live also, John 14 verse 19, and previously that he gives his sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish, and none shall snatch them out of his hand. John 10 verse 28, yea the Father's hand also securing them, verse 29. Can any assurance be conceived plainer or stronger? Thus in Christ alone, by his sacrifice and the sovereign gift of life, we have the principle of two trees, and this in fullness of blessing for all that believe, whereas the unbeliever, despising the word, and as self-confident as he is weak and sinful, repeats the error of Adam and Israel to his ruin. As Christians we have the treasure of Christ in our earthen vessel, and are responsible to be always bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus, the new nature, may be manifested in our body.